Okay, this is it, part three of our uh, three-part series. And this is where we uh, uh, look at what TDC, what, what the benefits of TDC can be on different patients and different people. And again, if you are liking the content that you're seeing in these videos, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and make sure you press the little like button, the little bing goes up, and that uh, helps us decide uh, whether people are liking the content or not and whether we have to change direction. Okay, so let's get down and learn about the last final installment of the direct current. You also notice that uh, we can change the effect of the uh, uh, stimulus inside the brain simply by changing the electrode configuration. So from a, an anode cathode configuration like this, just simply uh, changing the anode and cathode uh, configuration changes the uh, areas of excitability, areas of inhibition, and the uh, functional pathways that get affected or get uh, 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 changed in between those electrodes. So the, um, there's a lot of things that we'll look at now about what actually uh, can alter or mod modulate the, the effect of the transcranial direct current on the brain. Um, and uh, these are all important things to consider. And those are the things that we consider when we're developing a treatment plan for a patient. So the, uh, like I was alluding to before, the, the, uh, the term T, so small t, capital D, capital C, small s, TDCS, is a distinctive term. And it's used across all of uh, the uh, human treatments and human research. And it is, involves only a fixed sustained direct current. So the lowercase t is important to emphasize the proper name that designates the specific stimulation approach. So it doesn't use any kind of subdural electrode stimulation. It only, it doesn't use alternating currents. It doesn't use even alternating uh, monophasic square, fa square uh, wave direct current. So there, it is a continuous direct current across the two electrodes for a specified time at a specified amperage. Okay, and that is the definition that we use. Now again, here's the setup that we usually see. We see some kind of a stimulator, which may include, uh, usually now we don't have any stimulators that plug into the wall. Usually they're all um, battery powered for safety reasons. Um, and there's leads that come off that connect to electrodes, which are usually surrounded in sponges and potentially or often held in place by some kind of band setup. Uh, uh, there are applications that use caps that have uh, specific holes designated as the 1020 electrode system placement system. And uh, then you can use those to set your montage system and the electrode positioning that you use. So I'm getting ahead of myself now, but we'll talk about more about montages later in the last, uh, later uh, in lesson three. Okay, so the again, we'll go back to the, the uh, a little review from lesson one. So uh, an electrode uh, from which the current enters the body is known as the anode. And any electrode where the current exits the body is known as the cathode. And uh, just remember that the uh, current flows from anode to cathode. The electrons flow from cathode to anode. So when we're talking about um, TDCS, we're only referring for the most part, especially in clinical application, to the uh, flow of the current, okay? So usually we're always uh, referring to the current flowing from the anode to the cathode. So this is showing here, anode is the red, usually by convention always designated as the red electrode. The current flow, to the black electrode or the cathode, okay? And that flow is uh, regulated by uh, some kind of a, a, a machine that will regulate the uh, potential difference across the electrodes and keep the ionic flow constant. 
Okay, now usually direct current also refers to a, a, at least one electrode has to be on the head. Now most, you know, virtually all uh, treatment DC, TDCS, is with two electrodes or more on the head. And we'll get to this in a second. So uh, reminding you again from uh, a little bit of review, a little more detail from lesson one, is that the, uh, in the literature you will have uh, terms anodal TDCS or cathodal T TDCS. And what that means is the primary target is the, uh, the primary target of the inhibition or the stimulation will be the one indicated by which electrode they're primarily referring to. So to, to simplify, anodal stimulation will mean that the target that they're trying to stimulate is under the anode here, and that's really the, um, the primary target. A cathodal stimulus would be a, an inhibition type stimulus of a target area of the brain. And we see that remembering that uh, the uh, changes that occur inside the brain are, changed, are changes induced by um, ionic flows. Okay, so we can get a depolarization um, with, a cat, uh, with an anodal stimulus. So let's say our target now is this uh, right uh, sort of frontal cortex area. We can stimulate that right frontal cortex area uh, with the anode, and that will result in depolarization uh, in that general area. Now, we can also use a different technique where we do cathodal stimulation of that same area, and that will result in a hyperpolarization of the membrane potentials. Now, going back to our previous lessons, remember that depolarization means it's moving the system or the neuron more towards threshold so that the chance of firing an actual potential or firing that system in, increases. If we look at the hyperpolarization, that's moving the system away from threshold, which means the probability of that system firing decreases. So in one instance, we have an excitation component. In another instance, we have an inhibition component. So when we're talking about uh, specific targeted areas and we talk about anodal stimulation of a, of a specific target, we're usually talking about depolarizing or exciting that area or stimulating that area of the brain. When we're talking about a cathodal stimulation of a certain target area, we're usually talking about inhibition or reduction of activity in, in that area. Okay, so that's the difference uh, between the anode and the cathode. Now, we will see, uh, as we get more and explore this in more detail, various uh, assumptions about excitation and inhibition at certain electrodes need to or, or may change depending upon the parameters that we put around the electrodes. So the length of time that we have them on, the uh, amount of current that's flowing between them, the uh, types of or the location of the electrodes, all of these things can change the degree of excitation or the degree of inhibition, as well as there are, uh, you know, certain variations just in normal people that will allow uh, variants of, or variations in the stimulus or inhibition uh, levels that happen underneath the uh, electrodes. Now, uh, we can also have uh, intensity variation with the number of electrodes that we have and the variation of anodes and cathodes that we have. So remember we talked about uh, the simple application, TDCS, involves two electrodes on the head, okay? And we now have another variant of direct current called high definition direct current, where we have um, more than one, more than two electrodes on the head. And the variance, this increases the specificity of the, of the um, stimulation 
of the areas of stimulation and, and it also changes the current flow through the areas which we're stimulating. So remember we said that any current that goes in has to equal the current that comes out. So in this case, if we put uh, four, uh, four uh, milliamps of current in through this red anode, then each one of these cathodes needs to take one fourth of that current out. So theoretically, there would be a outflow of one milliamp for each cathode. So four milliamps uh, being injected into the brain and then one milliamp leaving at each one of these cathodes. Now that can vary slightly, uh, as you can see from some of the modeling that has been done, but it can vary based on the, uh, the location of, of the actual electrodes. So the, if they're located over an area that has uh, 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 easy access, for instance, to some of the ventricular canals, then that current may vary because the current will flow through the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, maybe at a different rate than it throws, flows through the brain tissue. If there is a scar tissue involved, a tumor, uh, a stroke in that area, that may vary the uh, way in which the current flows from the anode to the cathodes. And uh, that also uh, is the same for two electrodes. So all those variants are exactly the same. But when we have uh, five electrodes on the brain, it gets a bit more complicated and we could have variations in flow. So this is a, a new development where we have uh, multi-electrodes or high definition. Now it's called high definition because we can theoretically um, uh, define the area of which we move current through much more accurately when we have more electrodes. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of uh, um, practical implications that um, this brings about, which we'll discuss in the, uh, in the clinical series in our uh, um, postgraduate diploma. But for now, you just need to know that there are a variety of ways in which we could um, use direct current, which we can use to um, focus the direct current activity in high definition direct current, or we can use a more uh, generalized stimulation uh, ranging from inhibition to excitation with the two electrode system and the TDCS that we've uh, been talking about. Okay, now a dose uh, for a single session of TDCS basically it needs to uh, be defined by the electrode montage. Now, the montage involves the different skin areas, so the actual area in which the electrodes touch. So is it in the frontal cortex, in the parietal cortex, the cephalic cortex, and the size of the uh, electron, or sorry, the size of the electrode and the sponge system that's used. And so the position of the electrodes, the skin contact that's developed by the uh, uh, contact of those electrodes with the skin and uh, the uh, size of that contact are all um, considered part of the montage. Now it also, we, the dose depends on the stimulus intensity and the duration of the applied current. So we could have a, for instance, a six centimeter square electrode contact at the anode and the cathode. Say, uh, if we looked at uh, this particular presentation here, which is uh, FP2, F3. So we could have a six centimeter contact electrode here, <coughs> six, six centimeter contact electrode here. We could run a certain uh, current between these two electrodes. So that's the stimulus intensity and we could do it over a variety of time. So we could, for instance, a standard um, dosage that we might use in treatment uh, in uh, 
of depression, for instance, might be a, uh, a, a, a montage of uh, FP2, F3 at one milliamp for 10 minutes. So there's your, uh, your dosage. Now, there, there's some complicating factors when we get into um, what, is, what type of current is actually moving and uh, going through specific areas because the contacts of the electrodes may vary across the electrode. So if you don't have a, a, e, an equal current flow or an equal uh, impedance, across the uh, entire electrode, you can get hot spots on the electrode where more current will flow than other areas of the electrode. So this is why it's important when we're, um, develop, when we're setting up the uh, electrodes on people, we make sure that the electrode contact is um, consistent across the electrode. And we can do this with, uh, most of the machines have measurements of impedance right in, built right into them so that we can see how good the contact is at the time. Um, usually if a patient starts to complain that uh, they feel a really bad tingling or it's, a, you know, it's an uncomfortable situation and it doesn't go away within one to two seconds, which would normally be the up ramp uh, timing, uh, we then would stop the treatment and investigate why that is because they may have a hot spot on the electrode. So when we talk about dose, we need to think about a lot of things. We need to think about the electrode montage. We need to think about the simulation intensity. And we need to think about the duration of the applied current, the time. Okay, now usually these, uh, all of the T TDCS machines that we use uh, clinically are current controlled. That means that the current stays constant. So. The current will stay constant because the machine is adjusting the voltage. So there is a, uh, it's, it's basically varying the voltage to make sure that that flow of ions across the brain remains at a constant current. Okay, so that's uh, quite important with the direct current machines to understand that uh, if we say we're delivering one milliamp of current over 10 minutes, we need to know that we have maintained that one milliamp through the whole 10 minutes, even though some of the impedance may have changed on the electrodes at various times during the treatment. So um, these are um, lots of times you'll see pictures of a, of, a, of a nine volt battery being connected to the brain and that's, you know, that's how we produce DC. Well, yes it is, but that current would not be consistent because the impedance would change and the voltage wouldn't change, so the current flow would change. And that's sort of not what we want in, um, in a direct current treatment. So we need to have uh, pretty sophisticated machines that will um, monitor the voltage change or monitor the current change to make sure that um, it remains constant, okay? Now, how does the TDCS actually work? Well, um, we believe, we're quite sure, that it does not induce an actual neuronal action potential or neuronal firing in, uh, in systems by delivering a super threshold stimulus. Okay, usually it will um, alter the membrane depolarization like we talked about before where we can get a movement towards threshold or a movement away from the threshold, which then modifies the rate at which the system fires, depending on any given stimulus. So it looks like there's a, um, a change in the membrane potential, or the change in the uh, ease in which the membrane potential can change. That's one of the ways that the direct current uh, uh, works. And lots of times, uh, the changes that we are measuring uh, in an experimental situation we think are coming from the dendritic uh, areas of the neurons. So the change in the dendritic collection areas of the neurons will have an alteration in their membrane potential which means they will either fire more easily or fire uh, less frequently depending on what uh, electronics, depending on what um, 
uh, electrode exposure that are being uh, mostly influenced by, whether it's the anode or the cathode. Generally, we think that the uh, cortical activity is enhanced by the anode and inhibited by the cathode. And, and as I've said, those, those uh, assumptions can change based on a few uh, factors, which we're going to uh, look at uh, in lesson three. Now, how does, this, how does the uh, change that we see in the membrane potential actually happen? Because um, the TDCS actually has an effect longer than when it is applied to the system. So I mean, that means that it's not just the current change. It's not just the current flow that's causing the change in the membrane potential because it lasts after the current has been removed. So the, the change continues. And we think that it may be um, associated with changes in the synaptic microenvironment. So modifying the synaptic strength of the NMDA receptors or altering gabagenergic activity, for instance, in the inhibition areas. Um, it can also uh, modulate downstream uh, intracortical and, and cortical spinal neurons. So we know that uh, uh, perhaps through this, through this method of altering uh, NMDA receptor firing or altering the gabagenergic activity, uh, downstream we can get changes in intracortical activities, intracortical uh, um, uh, nuclear activity levels like in the uh, um, areas of the thalamus or in the areas of the uh, uh, basal ganglia, even cerebellum we talked about could be influenced by the T TDCS. But we're also noticing there's changes in the uh, cortical spinal activations. So there could be, uh, that could be a downstream effect or it could be a direct effect, we're not really sure yet but uh, it, we know the effect exists. So these are all um, quite exciting things because if we can alter and, and learn how to do it better, if we can alter the strength of the NMDA, M, NMDA receptors and the gabagenergic receptors, we can really have a strong uh, and uh, meaningful change in certain areas of the brain that are dysfunctioning uh, and causing symptoms in people. Now, as I just uh, alluded to, we've also noticed that the DC can also affect the spinal neurons. So not just the uh, cortical uh, neurons projecting to the spinal cord, but also the neurons within the spinal cord itself. Um, so we have uh, seen that most of the changes that, that we have measured experimentally are non-synaptic. So they're possibly involving transient changes of, of per, potentially protein channels that are localized below the stimulating electrodes, or they're involving uh, proponal systems, proprional systems that uh, we don't understand very well, but we know that the neurons are connecting uh, up and down the spinal cord in networks of uh, neurons, which may be influenced by the direct current uh, flow up and down the spinal cord. And again, given that uh, the constant electric flow, the constant electric current, will change the activity of polar molecules, and uh, this could influence the uh, rate at which neurotransmitters are released, or it could influence the rate at which the receptors are picking up those neurotransmitters. It could uh, affect the actual um, uh, electrical components that the brain is, the, the electrical uh, activity that the brain is sending down into the spinal cord. And uh, so there's just a lot of uh, neurochemical and neuroelectrical changes that this DC could potentially be involved with in the spinal cord. And so there's uh, great excitement uh, investigating uh, the effects of the spinal cord stimulation of the DC currents. Uh, again, non-invasive, so they're not implanting any kind of deep tissue stimulator or deep neural stimulator. They're not cutting through the skin, anything like that. So uh, the uh, side effects are minimal. 
Uh, it's non-invasive, so it's uh, easily uh, attached to the body, so the electrodes can be put on. We don't have to go to a special clinic. Uh, we can even do this at home if we had the proper training and uh, uh, had someone uh, being observed over telemedicine. So a very, very uh, crucial and exciting steps forward for anyone with spinal cord dysfunctions or spinal cord injuries. Uh, potential is uh, not known yet, but it is very, uh, very exciting. So we are uh, applying the direct currents in our clinics already and seeing uh, really, put, uh, really great change in the um, clinical measurements that we use for people and also in people's uh, ability to function in life. Now, let's talk about the direct and the indirect effects. So we kind of touched on this a little bit. The direct effect happens while the actual current is applied across the brain or across the spinal cord. <clears throat> and the indirect effects are what happens after we take that away or what, what isn't happening specifically because of the current moving. So uh, basically any connectivity-driven alterations of distant cortical and subcortical areas can be thought of as, uh, well, the current is on, can be thought of as direct effects. So if we see uh, any changes in the cortical and subcortical areas while the current is actually running, those are considered direct effects. And when we take the current away, any effects that <clears throat> continue to happen or in addition to the ones that we've previously seen, will be considered indirect effects. Now, the electrical fields that we produce under the DC <coughs> can produce several different effects on tissues. Excuse me. Now, this is something that we haven't touched on a lot yet, but there are effects on vessels, so via vessel dilation, constriction potentials, effects on connective tissue, uh, so uh, healing rates, um, reproduction rates, that stuff on connective tissue, and pathophysiological mechanisms like inflammation, cell migration, vascular motility, so movement of, uh, of different types of cells uh, through the blood system, through the uh, capillary system, so cells exiting and entering capillaries, um, streaming of uh, in, in inflammation uh, or immune system cells through the blood. A variety of different things have the potential to be influenced by the uh, direct current. We also see effects on cellular structures. So things inside the cell like cytoskeletons and mitochondria and even the membrane on the, on, on the neurons and on the glial cells that the current is going through also uh, have potential to have uh, pretty considerable indirect effects. And there's also a whole uh, field of research looking at the non-neuronal components of TDS stimulation. So how does it affect immune system cells? How does it affect um, even the uh, activation or the uh, effect of hormones on uh, different types of cells? So there's a lot of uh, research now into this uh, indirect and direct effects of TDCS. Okay, so uh, that's going to uh, bring to a close this lesson, and I hope you've had, uh, I hope this has opened up your mind to the potential of what uh, the trans direct, the trans uh, cranial direct current has in the treatment of different uh, conditions, different um, uh, dysfunctions inside the brain, and even the effect that it may have on uh, addiction and the effect that it may have on performance enhancement. So a lot of exciting things 
coming about from the, the direct current stimulus and uh, we'll keep you up to date on that as uh, we move forward in our diploma of neuroscience and for those of you moving on into the advanced diploma the postgraduate diploma you'll be kept up to date in all of the um, uh, events and all of the discoveries that are happening in the transcranial direct current world.